Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we take a look back to April 1983 to see what's happening in the Spectrum world, we play with the Rotronics wafer drive, we check out some early Vortex games, and take a look at some newer releases. First it's back into our time machine, to April 1983. Sinclair's plans to produce a Preston adapter for the ZX81 Spectrum computers have been dropped or frozen according to the company spokesman. Things have been put on hold as they feel that the market is not right at the moment, but Micronet 800, part of Prestel, is already working on their own adapter for the Sinclair machines. A package to allow the low-cost Tandy printer on the Spectrum has been launched by Hampshire company Softtest. The combined hardware and software package will retail for around £35 and allow users to print to the four-colour Tandy CGP115 printer. Quicksilver has had a mass release of 14 games across several formats. For the Spectrum, they are launching Astro Blaster, Frenzy, Trader and Word Processor. Prices for the Sinclair machine have been dropped by a number of retailers including WH Smith. The 16K version can now be had for £99.95, down from £125. The 48K version also gets a price reduction from £175 down to £129.95. Price reduction ties in with the Sinclair's own strategy, which would see its own price reductions from May. A local area network solution for the Spectrum is being developed as part of the new interface, soon to be available for the Spectrum. Interface 1, required to run the new microdrives, will not only feature an RS-232 interface, but the ability to network up to 64 Spectrums together. And now on to the top selling games. With Penetrator and The Hobbit still hogging the top 5 for the last month, the new titles entering the top 10 include View 3D, not really a game, but kudos for getting a utility into the top 10 from Scion. Arcade conversions are flooding the charts again, with Frogger from A&F, Galaxian from Arctic, Silversoft have two in the form of Orbiter, a Defender clone, and the Centipede clone called Cyber Rats. Finally, Black Crystal, a massive six-part RPG adventure game from Carnell. And that was the news from April 1983. The Rotronics wafer drive was released as a direct competitor to Sinclair's Micro Drive, offering large storage and fast access, something to replace the painfully slow cassette medium. As with the microdrive, it never really managed the task, and the Rotronics system never reached the sales numbers of the Sinclair unit. It's a large device that connects directly to the Spectrum via the edge connector and offers a direct pass through for other peripherals. Also included in the unit, as well as dual drives, was a Centronics printer port and an RS-232 interface. The dual 128K drives use the same continuous tape loop system like the microdrive, but used lower quality tape. This inevitably led it to higher return rates. The wafers came in four flavours, 16, 32, 64 and 128K. There were speed differences between these, with the larger format being slower due to access times. The drives worked at two speeds as well, the fast one for seeking and the slow one for loading. Some tests conducted by Yar Spectrum painted a less than perfect picture when it came to loading times. On the plus side though, you did get two drives and for a starting price of £129. Commercially there was very little software release for it. Sherlock, Muggsy, Heathrow, Night Flight 2, Starbike, the Psydab Trilogy, Bear Bother, Loopy Laundry, World Cup and The Artist are one of the few that come to mind. Supplied with the unit was a word processor called Spectral Writer and a utility wafer containing transfer and formatting tools. Sadly my copy of Spectral Writer suffered a tape break while making this feature. I just hope my other wafers don't go the same way. Initiating the onboard ROM caused the Spectrum memory to be paged out and the wafer drive's OS to be paged back in. This gave you new formatting, verifying and cataloguing commands. The disadvantage though was that this took up 2K of memory, meaning that large 48K games would not work. Loading and saving your own games was easy, but transferring commercial software proved very difficult, almost always involving writing your own basic loaders. 
Having tried many games, including early 16k ones, I still hadn't managed to get anything across onto a wafer after three hours of trying. Doing this with protected software would be impossible, even using something like Multiface would involve modifying the loaders to take into account the new syntax. Finally, after four hours, I managed to get Bugbyte's Birds and the Bees transferred across. This 25k game normally takes about 2 minutes 25 seconds to load. Using a 32k wafer, I managed to get it loading in 1 minute dead. As time went on for the unit, sales were not as high as expected and the price began to fall, eventually being offered for an amazing price of 14.95. At that price, this was a bargain. But the problem was that hardware, even today, is only as strong as the support it gets from software. And as this got very little, it was set to fail. Sad really is the unit itself is pretty robust, only let down by the wafers. This isn't a bad system when compared to the microdrive, but it's easy to see why the microdrive won. This is Android 1 from 1983. In the game you control a robot that has to reach the reactor and destroy it before it explodes and kills everyone. The game is not a frantic robot blasting game like Robotron, instead it has elements of planning, control and careful movement. The reactor is at the far right of the plane area, which takes up about 5 or 6 screens, and you have to guide your robot through various rooms infested with stationary and moving objects. The walls can be shot creating routes into the next area. Blasting in the right places will create an easy route back, because once the reactor is destroyed, you've got to get your robot back to the start position to complete the mission. This is a nice little game, only let down by awkward controls. Instead of moving in the set direction, your android rotates, you then walk and fire in that direction. This can be difficult at first, as you find yourself continually running about and bumping into things, but as the game goes on and you get more used to it, it becomes easier to control. Overall this game isn't too taxing and can offer a short shot of excitement. Why not give it a try? From robots to cowboys and gun law. This is a cowboy themed first person shooter, but take any images of Doom or Quake out of your head straight away. Remember this is the Spectrum. You are a bounty hunter hired to rid the town of an evil gang. You can see both sides of the street by switching views, and the scenery moves slowly as you automatically walk up and down. Members of the gang pop up at windows and fences, and you have to shoot them before they shoot you. Sometimes they are not directly visible because they are behind you, in which case you have to switch views to quickly locate them. Once in view you just move your gun sight over them and fire. You have a limited number of bullets that gets replenished every so often, but you have to keep an eye on this, as one missed shot could mean that you haven't got the vital bullet to get rid of the last gang member. You are warned when someone is about to shoot you, as the red cowboy at the bottom begins to flash, and you hear a beeping sound. If someone's aiming at you and you haven't got any bullets, just hope that they've got a red or yellow hat, because this means randomly they won't actually fire back, but are you willing to take a gamble? The graphics are very basic, as you can see, but on the other hand very functional. Control is smooth and sound is adequate. I quite like this game, despite its obvious age, and I can easily get a good 30 minutes of playing without any problems. Another early game that you might just want to try. Maritrini, I hope that's how you pronounce it, wakes up with a hangover and takes a call from her former employer. His daughter has been kidnapped and the town is full of monsters and zombies, but before he can explain, the line is cut. Maritrini sets off to help. This new game is obviously a slant on Gauntlet, and includes some really nice mini intros to each level, setting the scene and expanding the story. The main element of the game is a typical gauntlet style overhead run and shoot affair, destroying monster generators, collecting food and finding keys that unlock the next level. 
four-way scroll in his character base which sometimes distracts, but it's this way for a reason, it's to get proper attribute scrolling. The main character and monsters are all pixel smooth, and the gameplay is just about right, although I never managed to get past the second level. The game area is large and each level consists of four sub-levels. Each level has slightly different graphics to coincide with the ongoing story. This is a really nice game with some lovely atmospheric music playing as you charge through the levels blasting anything that moves. If you're a fan of this type of game this is definitely worth looking at. Even if you're not, give this one a try, it's very well written and plays just right. Because, my children, it's time to play for the last time. <laughs> More TV. RT Vicar is a horizontal shoot em up, released by Chronosoft and written by Jonathan Caldwell. As with most shoot em ups, let's ignore the plot and just get on with some blasting. And this game certainly delivers. I love shoot em ups, but I'm horrendously bad at them, as you can probably tell. As with other games of this type, for example R Type, the background scrolls smoother from right to left and various alien nasties swarm around with the sole intent of wiping that silly smirk off your face after you've just discovered this great game. Your nicely animated ship can get power-ups and will eventually reach end of level bosses. This is where my playing skills is embarrassingly bad, so we'll skip over this bit. I will keep on playing just in case I manage to fluke my way past the first boss, which really says how addictive this game is. The 48k version is available from Chronosoft's website for a very reasonable 4 99 including postage, and comes complete with cassette and packaging. The 128k version is available free but has a different 4th level, and obviously no packing as it's download only. This is certainly one for shoot 'em up fans, a great game that's well written with bags of playability. That's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.